If you have your Bibles, turn to Deuteronomy 33 this morning. Deuteronomy All right, Deuteronomy 33, let's look at verse 1, because this actually sets the tone for the whole chapter. This tells you what the whole chapter is about. Deuteronomy 33, verse 1, And this is the blessing wherewith Moses, the man of God, blessed the children of Israel before his death. And uh, we've been down through verse 6. Verse 6, he begins to list the tribes, and, it, and uh, we talked about Reuben. And today we're going to be in verse 7. It says, And this is the blessing of Judah. And he said, Hear, Lord, the voice of Judah, and bring him unto his people. Let his hands be sufficient for him, and be thou an help to him from his enemies. Lord, we thank you for this day. We thank you, Lord. It's just a privilege to be here this morning. God, help us as we look at your, as your word. As we look at your word, Lord, may it help us this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. Judah. Judah was not the firstborn. Reuben was the firstborn. And, of course, uh, you know, we talked about Reuben last week. And, and um, you know, uh, the blessing of the firstborn should have been his. The firstborn, uh, they would get a double portion. And there was a spiritual blessing uh, among the Jews. There was a spiritual blessing that was passed down to the firstborn. Uh, Reuben missed that because of some things that he did. He did get a blessing, but he forfeited the blessing of the firstborn. And you see uh, Judah in this portion uh, now rises to the top. And there are some reasons for that. Um, you know, we're going to look at a couple of them. Um, but, you know, there's some things in the Bible uh, that God does that only God knows why. Um, somebody was talking about this very thing a week or so ago, and they were talking about Judah, and they were talking about some of the some of the really not good things that Judah did, and um, and they said, you know, why why did God pass this huge blessing on to Judah? Well, we're going to talk about that this morning, but there are some things that happen in the Bible as you read. You know, you'll read some things, and you'll think, man, you know, why did the Lord do this? And this. This really doesn't add up. And and um, the reason is, is sometimes there are things that God doesn't tell us. You know, God looks at the heart. God saw something. But Judah rises to the top. In Genesis 49, he is listed fourth in the lineup. In Deuteronomy 33 here, he shows up as second in the listing. You hit the end of the Bible, Revelation chapter 7, he is at the top. He ends well. And the Lord Jesus Christ connects himself to Judah. Keep your place here and look at Genesis 49. Genesis 49. Here in Genesis 49, Jacob is speaking directly to his sons. In Deuteronomy 33, my oh my, a whole pile of years and years and years and years have passed. And Moses is blessing the descendants. But in Genesis 49, he has the, his 12 sons standing right in front of him. And man... You know, he mentions Reuben, Simeon, and Levi in verses 4 and 5. And it, it is not very nice at all what he has to say to his own sons. He is on his, he is facing death and his last words. And uh, boy, it's not good. 
But then you hit Judah in chapter, in verse 8. Genesis 49, verse 8. Judah, thou art he whom thy brethren shall praise. Thy hand shall be in the neck of thine enemies. Thy father's children shall bow down before thee. Judah is a lion's whelp. That means it's, he's the child of a, of a lion. He's a young lion. From the prey, my son, thou art gone up. He stooped down. He couched as a lion and as an old lion. Who shall rouse him up? The scepter shall not depart from Judah, nor a lawgiver from between his feet until Shiloh come. And unto him shall the gathering of the peoples be, binding his foal unto the vine and his ass's colt unto the choice vine. He washed his garments in wine and his clothes in the blood of grapes. His eyes shall be red with wine and his teeth white with milk. You know, in this passage, uh, the Lord, by the Holy Ghost, from the mouth of Jacob, suddenly pronounces a massive prediction and a massive blessing on Judah. And suddenly the Lord Jesus Christ becomes connected to the tribe of Judah forever. In verse 9, it says Judah is a lion's whelp. Verse 9, it says he couched as a lion. And in Revelation 5, verse 5, John turns and he says, I saw in the midst of the throne a lamb. And he identified that lamb in the midst of the throne that had been slain. He, he, he announced him as the lion of the tribe of Judah, the lion. Verse 10, it says, the scepter shall not depart from Judah. That's the ruler. Nor a lawgiver from between his feet until Shiloh come. And boy, that's a, that's a prophecy about Jesus Christ. He said, that, that line of rulers would not depart from Judah until Jesus comes, and unto him shall the gathering of the people be. And then verse 11 and 12 there, he mentions, verse 11, he washed his garments in wine and his clothes in the blood of grapes. His eyes shall be red with wine. And that is a reference to Jesus Christ as the judge. In verse 10, and 11, he's the, he's the ruler, Jesus Christ is, and he's the lawgiver, but Jesus Christ is also the judge. And look with me in Isaiah 63. It says there, he, he washed his garments in wine. Look at Isaiah 63. God connects his son with the tribe of Judah forever. Forever. It says he washed his garments in wine. Isaiah 63. Isaiah 63. Who is this that cometh from Edom? with dyed garments from Basra, this that is glorious in his apparel, traveling in the greatness of his strength. And then he answers the question. I that speak in righteousness, mighty to save. Wherefore art thou red in thine apparel? And thy garments like him that treadeth in the wine fat. He said, why is this? Verse three, he answers. I have trodden the winepress alone, and of the people there was none with me, for I will tread them in mine anger and trample them in my fury, and their blood shall be sprinkled upon my garments, and I will stain all my raiment, for the day of vengeance is in mine heart, and the year of my redeemed is come. You know, it says in the book of John, that God has committed all judgment unto the Son. And out of Judah is the scepter and the lawgiver and the judge. And Judah is connected to Jesus Christ forever. Look at Hebrews chapter 7. If you see, you know, the Thessalonians and the Timothys and Titus 
Philemon, and then you'll see Hebrews, Hebrews chapter 7. There was a spiritual blessing that fell to Judah that superseded all the blessings. Man, we're going to talk, Lord willing, about Levi shortly. And what a blessing fell to Levi. And what a blessing fell to Joseph. Unbelievable blessings. But the blessing of Judah superseded all of them. To Levi was given the priesthood. And yet there was a, a spiritual blessing that came out on top of that blessing. Look at Hebrews chapter 7, verse 11. If therefore perfection were by the Levitical priesthood, for under it the people received the law, what further need was there that another priest should arise after the order of Melchizedek and not be called after the order of Aaron? For the priesthood being changed, you know, that, that little phrase, you know, it, something changed, you know, just really obvious things from the Old Testament to the New. For the priesthood being changed, there is made of necessity a change also in the law. For he of whom these things are spoken pertaineth to another tribe of which no man gave attendance at the altar. For it is evident that our Lord sprang out of Judah, which tribe Moses spake nothing concerning priesthood. Wow. Wow. When you read about uh, Judah, um, there's some interesting things that come out. Um, you know, we mentioned last week Reuben's past, and Reuben pulled a dumb stunt that really cast a shadow over the rest of his life. But Judah was not spotless either. Um I want you to look with me at Genesis 38. You know, you read these Bible stories and, and uh, you know, it says the things that were written for time were written for our learning. And as you read them, you know, the, the Lord is trying to tell us something. The Lord didn't just record, you know, in, in a lot of these lives, the Lord just gives us one or two incidents in their whole life. But that's because there's something really important that the Lord wants us to see. In Genesis 38, we get a little glimpse into Judah's past. In Genesis 38, verse 1, And it came to pass at that time that Judah went down from his brethren and turned in to a certain Adulamite, whose name was Hira. And Judah saw there the daughter of a certain Canaanite, whose name was Shua. And he took her and went in unto her, and she conceived and bare a son, and he called his name Ur. So he begins to tell you the story of, you know, Judah, and he meets this woman, and she becomes his wife. And look down at verse 12. And in process of time, the daughter of Shua, Judah's wife, died. And Judah was comforted. Now, there was some time lapsed and he mourned and he got over it. Judah was comforted and went up into his sheep shears to Timnath, he and his friend Hira, the Adulamite. And it was told Tamar, saying, Behold, thy father-in-law go, father goeth up to Timnath to shear his sheep. And she put her widow's garments off from her and covered her with a veil and wrapped herself and sat in an open place, which is by the way to Timnath. For she saw that Sheila was grown and she was not given unto him to wife. You guys remember the Old Testament custom that if if a man, if, if a, you know, a man, you know, and his wife and and the man died having left no seed. The brother was supposed to marry her. And, and it was supposed to move on like that. Well, in this case, that was not followed. Um, verse 14, the end of the verse. 
For she saw that Sheila was grown, and she was not given unto him to wife. When Judah saw her, he thought her to be an harlot, because she had covered her face. And he turned unto her by the way and said, Go to, I pray thee, let me come in unto thee. You, you, you realize what you're reading. You know, Judah is, he's alone. He's been alone for a little while. And, and he comes to a certain place. And here's this woman beside the road. And, and the way she's, something about the way she's dressed and the way she covered her face, it was the flag of a hooker. And, um, and there's nobody there, just him and her. And, uh, and he says, okay. And he decides to uh, go in to her. Verse 16. And he turned into her by the way and said, go to, I pray thee, let me come in unto thee. For he knew not that she was his daughter-in-law. And she said, what wilt thou give me? You know, they, they do it for a fee, right? What wilt thou give me that thou mayest come in unto me? And he said, I will send thee a kid from the flock. He said, later I'll send you some, you know, you got to remember their animals. That was, that was a lot of their cash. That was their, their mode of trade. And in verse 17, she said, wilt thou give me a pledge till thou send it? She said, uh, well, you better give me a down payment. I don't trust you. Verse 18. And he said, what pledge shall I give thee? And she said, thy signet and thy bracelets and thy staff that is in thine hand. And he gave it her and came in unto her and she conceived by him. And she arose and went away and laid by her veil from her and put on the garments of her widowhood. So she puts away her hooker costume because she, she had a plan. She was doing something here. And Judah sent the kid, verse 20, by the hand of his friend, the Adolamite, to receive his pledge from the woman's hand. But he found her not. Then he asked the men of that place, saying, where is the harlot that was openly by the wayside? And they said, there was no harlot in this place. And he returned to Judah and said, I cannot find her. And also the men of the place said that there was no harlot in this place. And Judah said, well, let her take it to her, lest we be shamed. Behold, I sent this kid, and thou hast not found her. And it came to pass about three months after that it was told Judah, saying, Tamar, thy daughter-in-law, hath played the harlot. And behold, she is with child by whoredom. All of a sudden, his daughter-in-law, who is a widow, all of a sudden, you know, somebody notices, you know, she's, She's gaining weight, but it's not because she's been eating Hershey bars. You know, she's she's looking pregnant. And you got to remember, you know, it's a different day. In that day, you did that among the Jews, and the penalty for that was death. Verse 24, Behold, she is with child by whoredom. And Judah said, Bring her forth and let her be burnt. What a hypocrite. What a hypocrite. Oh, how the hypocrite loves to enforce the penalty. Well, they're just as guilty. But he hadn't been caught, see? Not yet. Verse 25, they, they go, they go ring, round her up because they're going to put her to death. Verse 25, when she was brought forth, she sent to her father-in-law saying, by the man whose these are, am I with child? And she said, discern, I pray thee, whose are these? The signet and bracelets and staff. You realize what's going on here? He says, bring her. And he says, we're going to burn her to death. So this is a public event. So they bring her, and man, they're they're probably uh, they're probably not handling her real nice either. And they're they're about to do her in, and uh, she has a, a a little little few things here, and she says, um, you know, the man that got me. She's can your man look at him right in his eyeballs? 
You know, the man that got me pregnant, these are his. Verse 26, and Judah acknowledged them and said, she hath been more righteous than I, because that I gave her not to Sheila, my son, and he knew her again no more. You know, in this, this thing right here, um, Judah had the perfect opportunity to be a narcissist. Man, we got something that is in our society. It is like the plague. And it's always existed, you know, and, and, and a lot of these things existed in times past. We just didn't have a label for it. But, you know, it, we, it exists in our society today in epidemic proportions. You know, it runs by different names. There's gaslighting. There's mirroring. There's whatever you want to call it. But, oh, he had the perfect opportunity to be a narcissist here. He had the power. Um, she had no recourse. You know, uh, she she had no way to clear herself. She had no way to defend herself. She's standing there with no husband, and she's obviously pregnant. You know, there was no lawyer that was going to get her off the hook. There was no court of law. There was no there was no way to delay this. He had the power. You got to remember, this was 1729 BC, not 2024. Judah had the perfect opportunity to deny the whole thing and to accuse her of lying and say, man, I don't know how you got to hold that stuff. That stuff's been missing out of my closet for three months now, and I wondered who stole it. Boy, it was a perfect opportunity. He could have blackened her name. He could have, you know, well, they were going to burn her to death. But, you know, he, he didn't have to burn her to death. He could have just uh, he could have just told everybody the story about this woman and, and made it so that she couldn't show her face in public anymore. It was convenient to kill her because that would be the end of that, and he would look spiritual. He could have made her life miserable, that's what narcissists do. He could have made himself look innocent and accused her of gross immorality. But instead, you ever wonder why God passed a blessing on a Judah? But what did he do? He, he could have really, you know, remember, remember a man named David? David wanted to cover his tracks. And you know what he did? He had Uriah killed. What did Judah do? Verse 26. And Judah acknowledged then and said, She hath been more righteous than I. You know, um, he acknowledged his sin and he let her go. He said, you know what? This is my fault. And he not only acknowledged it, everybody's standing there. You got a bunch of bloodthirsty men. It's just amazing how some people just, they're just, they really get, they really get into this deal of, you know, punishing somebody. And, um, and you'll always have an audience when you want to punish somebody. He's got an audience. And you know what he does in front of his audience? He says, hmm. She's telling the truth. This is my fault. You know where he winds up? He winds up in the line of Christ. Look at verse 27. And it came to pass in the time of her travail that behold, twins were in her womb. And it came to pass when she travailed that one, one of the twins, put out his hand and the midwife took and bound upon his hand, boy, this is amazing, a scarlet thread, saying this came out first. And it came to pass as he drew back his hand that behold, his brother came out and she said, hast thou broken forth? This breach be upon thee. Therefore, his name was called Fares. And afterward came out his brother that had the scarlet thread upon his hand 
and his name was called Zerah. You know, uh, in verse 29, that name, Fares, uh, you know where he shows up again? He shows up in Matthew 1, in the genealogy of Jesus Christ. You know, um, um, sometimes you'll, you'll be reading about these things, and some people will talk about the, the godly line of, of the Lord. And one guy said this, it's not the godly line, it's the messianic line, because there is no such thing as the godly line. Christ receiveth sinful men, even me with all my sin. This is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptation that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am chief. And thou shalt call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. He'll, he'll take you as you are. Now, he's not going to leave you as you are. But he'll take you as you are. And you know what he does? You know, the Lord isn't looking for perfect people because there, there is no such thing. Uh, those kind of people are not to be found. But it says this. He gave himself for us that he might redeem us from all iniquity and purify unto himself a peculiar people, zealous of good works. He will take you as you are with all your sin. And then you know what he wants to do? He'll up. Uh, He'll begin a work to purify you. Well, you look at Judah. What a, we don't, we don't know much about Judah, but we know there was at least one dark chapter in his past. But the thing you see about Judah is there is a change. There is a change while he lives. And Jacob is speaking with Judah standing right in front of him. You know, Reuben pulled a similar stunt and he brings it right up. But he doesn't with Judah. You see a checkered past, a spotted past overcome. He that humbleth himself shall be exalted. What did Judah do? He humbled himself. The way up is always to humble yourself. You know, in the in the blessings in Deuteronomy 33, there were several of those blessings that came and those descendants of the 12 tribes, they, they really, many of them had to overcome their father. But the children of Judah would not have to overcome their father. You know, we got a lot of families in here and, um, you know, it really would be a blessing, you know, Christ receiveth sinful men, even me, with all our sin. But it would be a wonderful thing if your children, though they will see your humanity, they will also see your humility. And they won't have to overcome us. That'd be a wonderful thing. Look in Deuteronomy 33 at the blessing of Judah. You know, in a sense, it, it sort of doesn't matter where you are now. If you'll if you'll just humble yourself and say, Lord, I got a new day. I got I got some new time in front of me. Lord, I will I will arise. I will turn to thee. Doesn't matter how dark your past is. And that's one of the lessons you learned from Deuteronomy 33 and Genesis 49 is that it doesn't matter what yesterday was if you will turn to God. Some, some great, massive blessing may still be yours. Look at Deuteronomy 33, verse 7, and this is the blessing of Judah. And he said, Hear, Lord, the voice of Judah, and bring him to his people. 
course, that that thought of, you know, hear, Lord, the voice of Judah. And of course, right away, you see, you know, that thought of answered prayer. And in these first couple of phrases, you see the span of his whole life. Hear, Lord, the voice of Judah. And bring him unto his people. Well, that's the whole span of his life, because what's what's that thing? Bring him unto his people. Well, that is that's the reference to his death and being on the other side. Look at a few verses with me. Look at Genesis 25. Bring him unto his people. Genesis 25 verse 8. Genesis 25 verse 8. Then Abraham gave up the ghost and died in a good old age, an old man and full of years, and was gathered unto his people. Look at Genesis 35. Genesis 35, verse 29. And Isaac gave up the ghost and died and was gathered unto his people, being old and full of days. Look at Genesis 49. Genesis 49, verse 33. And when Jacob had made an end of commanding his sons, he gathered up his feet into the bed and yielded up the ghost and was gathered unto his people. We could look at several more references. It just it that thought is often repeated in the Old Testament. He was gathered unto his people. It says about Judah. Hear, Lord, the voice of Judah. And bring him unto his people. And that's talking about a happy ending. That's talking about eternal life. Bring him unto his people. Man, there's a lot of descriptions about heaven. You know, we think of the place. We think of, you know, uh, no sickness. We think of, uh, you know, being young forever. We think of a lot of things. But one of the descriptions of eternity, whether it be good or bad, is being brought unto your people. He said, Lord, hear his prayers while he lives and bring him unto his people. It was his destination. It spoke of his arrival that on that day he would, boy, there'd be one big, massive family reunion. He would be brought unto his people. His people were the people of God. His people were those whose birthright and pursuit was a spiritual <coughs> blessing. You know, um, gathered, gathered. You know, that's good if it's heavenly. Bring him unto his people. Can you imagine somebody slips up beside you today after church and, and uh, just puts his arm around you and says, can I pray with you? And, you know, uh, you, you'd be glad for that, especially if you had confidence in their prayers. And they put their arm around you and they pray a few good things for you for this week and maybe next month and ask God to bless your kids. And then they say, and Lord, bring him to his people. For some of you, the, those closing words, they would be sweet words. And for some of you, those closing words would be words you'd go, wow. It'd make you, make you stop and think. Bring him unto his people. That's good if it's heaven. But it's bad if it's hell. Would you look at Matthew 13? Matthew 13.
Look at verse 24. Matthew 13, verse 24. Another parable put he forth unto them. So Jesus is telling them a story that they'll they'll be able to draw a spiritual lesson from. Okay. He says, Another parable put he forth unto them, saying, The kingdom of heaven is likened unto a man which sowed good seed in his field. But while men slept, his enemy came and sowed tares among the wheat and went his way. Now, tares is a plant over there that grows up and it in the early stages of its growth, it looks identical to wheat. And one of the worst things that could happen to you as a farmer, and you got to remember that was one of their main ways of life. One of the worst things that could happen is if somebody pulled a stunt like this, because all of a sudden it'd mess up your whole crop. It's, it's not like it would grow up like thistle. You know, you can spot thistle, you know, a mile away. But you can't spot tares. But while men slept, verse 25, his enemy came and sowed tares among the wheat and went his way. But when the blade was sprung up and brought forth fruit, finally, right, right about harvest time, then appeared the tares also. So the servants of the householder came and said unto him, Sir, Didst not thou sow good side seed in thy field? He said, "You didn't. You, you, your seed, it was good seed, right? From whence then hath it tares? And he said unto them, An enemy hath done this. The servant said unto him, Wilt thou then that we go and gather them up? But he said, Nay, lest while ye gather up the tares, ye root up also the wheat with them. Let both grow together until the harvest. And in the time of the harvest, I will say to the reapers, now watch the word, gather, gather. Gather ye together first the tares and bind them in bundles to burn them, but gather the wheat into my barn. Look at verse 36. Then Jesus sent the multitude away and went to the house, and his disciples came unto him, saying, Declare unto us the parable of the tares of the field. He answered and said unto them, he that soweth the good seed is the seed of man. The field is the world. The good seed are the children of the kingdom. But the tares are the children of the wicked one. The enemy that sowed them is the devil. The harvest is the end of the world, and the reapers are the angels. As therefore the tares are gathered and burned in the fire, so shall it be. In the end of this world, the son of man shall send forth his angels and they shall gather out of his kingdom all things that offend and them which do iniquity and shall cast them into a furnace of fire. There shall be wailing and gnashing of teeth. Then shall the righteous shine forth in the kingdom of their father who hath ears to hear. Let him hear. Um, you know, he said uh, he said this thing of gather them to your people. You know, that's wonderful if, if it's taught about heaven. But he said, but the children of the wicked one will also be gathered. And um, that gathering is dark. Revelation 21, it says, verse 8, but the fearful and unbelieving and the abominable and sorcerers and murderers and whoremongers and all adulterers and all liars shall have their part in the lake which burneth with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. You know, they, they have a great gathering. That's quite a crew. But the difference is, there's no singing there. You know, uh, man, we have get-togethers. If I said, you know, Friday night, we're going to have a get-together, you know, provided, you know, I gave you a little bit of notice and, you know, and like we do New Year's Eve or whatever, you know, and, and, uh, and you know, you know, right away I said, we're going to have a get-together and nobody gets nervous and nobody goes, I don't think I want to come. And, and oh, this is going to be awful. And, and this, this might not be safe. You don't think that. Because the term get together applies something good. You know, it's going to be restful. You know, nobody's going to work. Nobody's going to carry their bills into the room. It's, it's going to be good. It's a get together. You think of a family reunion. Now, I know a family reunion can be trying. It just depends on your family. But, but generally, a family reunion is intended to be a good time. People get together. You see aunts and uncles and cousins and nieces and nephews that you haven't seen forever. And there's laughter and there's singing and there's Food on the grill, and it's just, it's a good time. Where I, where I grew up many years ago, I, I was about 12 years old, and a little country church we attended, 
um, about 40 minutes from our house. We lived out in the country, man. That church was way out the country. And um, they had a custom there in that area, uh, really all through the South in the little uh, rural churches. Once every summer, they would have homecoming Sunday. Homecoming Sunday, it'd be in the heat of the summer. And, you know, they'd have big tables outside. And, you know, just just like, you know, what you ladies do, like on, you know, the Christmas thing or New Year's or whatever. Man, there was food, food, food and more food. It was wonderful. And we'd have church. And then after church, we'd have the dinner and they'd have some guest preacher in. He'd, they, we'd all be outside in chairs and there'd be people that used to belong to the church and people that knew people from years ago and people would converge. And um, man, it was a wonderful time. When you think of a get together, you think of a happy context. When you think of a gathering, it is wonderful as long as it's not in hell. They will be gathered, but there'll be no singing there. There'll be no smiles. There'll be no laughter. There'll be no water. There'll be no light for God is light. There'll be no love for God is love. Just darkness and weeping and wailing and pain and memories and torment and fire and in horrible tempest. And it will be forever. Moses says, Lord. He says, Lord, I want you to bless Judah. I, I pray, Lord, that all through his life, it'll be one answered prayer after another. And he said, Lord, I pray. I pray his relationship to you will be the real deal. I pray he will be gathered unto his people. I got a question for you this morning. Who are your people? You know, in the, in the country, people used to have an expression and they would say, oh, yeah, so and so and so and so and so and so. Oh, th th those are those are those are our people. And that was just an expression about their relatives. Oh, yeah, them, them's our people. You know, in Judges 11, verse 3, Jephthah uh, becomes a judge. And, and uh, man, Jephthah has a, wow, quite a rough start in life. And, and uh, he was rejected by his people until they needed him. And in that period when he's hanging out on his own and he's totally rejected, it says, and they were gathered vain men unto him. You know, he said, you know, people that gathered around Jephthah, you know who his crowd were? All the people that gave no thought for tomorrow and they didn't have a serious bone in their body and they didn't really care about what mattered and it was all about today and not about tomorrow. That was his crowd. In Zephaniah 3, it says, her prophets are light and treacherous persons. Her priests have polluted the sanctuary they have done violence to the law. Israel had reached a place there at the tail end of their, of their, their span there and, and uh, reaching into the captivity. And, oh, they still had church. But, but you know, uh, what had happened was, um, um, boy, there was a crowd there. And you see it into the New Testament, which would have been the Pharisees. He says, you know who they were? They were light and treacherous people. It was a joke. In Acts 17, Paul and Silas travel into a certain area and it says but the Jews moved with envy and took unto them certain lewd fellows of the baser sort and they gathered the company lewd fellows of the baser sort you know those are the kind that you know when they're when they're not at church you know they 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 joke about lewd things and they they look at lewd things and and they 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 talk about lewd things and they're pretty base they're pretty base way down here somewhere they're not in that high and holy place. They don't even care about that. They, who are your people? In Titus chapter one, Paul writes to Titus and he says, Titus, you're going you're gonna to look for some men that are going to further the cause of Jesus Christ. And he said, make sure that they're a lover of good men. You know, like Barnabas, for he was a good man. You say, how do you define a good man? All the Bible tells us, for he was a good man and full of the Holy Ghost and of faith and much people was added to the Lord. 
Who are your people? You know, someday you're going to be gathered to your people. Look at 1 John 4. If you hit the book of Revelation and just back up a few pages, you'll see Jude and 1st, 2nd, 3rd John. You know, one of the greatest blessings of being a Christian is one of the one of the ble greatest blessings of knowing the Lord is that one day we're going to be gathered unto our people. There's a song they sing. It's called In the Sweet Forever. Who are your people? Look at 1 John 4, verse 5. 1 John 4, verse 5. They are of the world. Therefore speak they of the world, and the world heareth them. We are of God. He that knoweth God heareth us. He that is not of God heareth not us. Hereby know we the spirit of truth and the spirit of error. Beloved, let us love one another, for love is of God, and everyone that loveth is born of God and knoweth God. He that loveth not knoweth not God. Um, who are your people? Man, there's never been a day when Christianity is eat up with so much hatred. Both in the online presence and the some of the online speakers and just just downright in our churches and in some of our homes, they're just eat up with hate. Who are your people? Oh, you'd wave at me and say, oh, pastor, these are my people. Really? Verse 8. He that loveth not knoweth not God. It doesn't matter what you say. It doesn't matter how many verses you got memorized. It doesn't matter. He that loveth not knoweth not God. For God is love. Look at chapter 5, verse 4. You're right there. It says, For whatsoever is born of God overcometh the world. And this is the victory that overcometh the world, even our faith. Who are your people? David said in Psalm 119, I am a companion of all them that fear thee. And of them that keep thy precepts. Who are your people? And we sing that song. Sing the wondrous love of Jesus. Sing his mercy and his grace. In the mansions bright and blessed. He's prepared for us a place. When we all get to heaven. Are you going? You're not going there unless those are your people now. You say, well, pastor, those. Are, well, why don't you make a shift and join the right people? And that begins with joining the savior of those people. Boy, Judas started off a disaster, but he humbled himself. And he made a decision. And Jesus said, all right, Judah, you're joining me and I'm joining you. And you got to, you're going to land with your people. Who are your people? The greatest blessing that you'll ever have is God hears your prayers and that you wind up as a Christian. With your people. Who are your people? Let's pray.
you know, it's funny. There's some people call themselves Christians, but, but they don't like sold out Christians. They don't like people that like to talk about the Lord. They just, they just, you know, they just, they just sort of want this, this thing where, you know, they don't have to be around those God loving Christians. You know what that, you know what that says? That says they're not your people. Don't deceive yourself about, hey, listen, either the people that love God are your people or your people are going to the other place. Who are your people? Let's pray. God bless, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Piano's going to play. If God has spoken to you this morning, why don't you talk to him? If he's your God and his people are your people, you ought to praise his name because he... He blotted out your checkered past because Christ receiveth sinful men and He saved you. You ought to praise His name. Maybe you got somebody on your heart and you know that they're not a friend to God's people and you love them. Maybe you ought to pray for them that they'll make that decision to choose God's people. your people if you'll ask the Holy Ghost right now he'll tell you he won't lie to you you may lie to yourself but he won't lie to you ask him say Lord who's my people and then the next thing he'll say is but I sure wish you were one of my people why don't you come today Lord, thank you that you would even want us, Lord, to be your people. God, thank you, Lord, for how good you've been. And God, you have received us as sinful men. God, thank you, Lord. Thank you, God, for the work that you're doing in our hearts so that we don't stay there. God, we pray you'd help everybody in this room that truly they might know thee. Lord, we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. You're dismissed. Thank <laughs> you.